The research suggests that from the 1980s, house prices have doubled every eight to 10 years. Have the conversation now and be prepared. Get your pre-approval and get ready so that when we do start to see rates come down, you, you're good to go. Is it going to be so significant that it's, it's going to increase by 100,000? Probably not. Welcome back to Property Now, where we are on a mission to make you the property pro in your group chat. Today, I sit down with the guys and we discuss what a rate cut means for the property market and what it means for you. We hope you enjoy. Today, we are going to talk about... Have I got everyone's attention in the room? You don't. Yeah, no. I feel like I'm a primary school <laughs> really? teacher. No. Boys, listen. Sorry, Miss Huxley. Yeah. <laughs> you got to go this. You're, you're bloody yeah, right. No, you do. Yeah. Eyes on me. Eyes on me. Thank you. That was magic when they used to do that. Everyone used to just start doing it. It worked. Magic. No, I was hands a, on heads now. I was a bit of a naughty kid in school, so that shit just got me more revved up. I was like, you tell me to be quiet. Or... Oh, yeah, give us a story. <laughs> well, growing up on a farm, Chris, as you say, <laughs> it was... <laughs> oh, wait till I swallow the coffee before you tell jokes. <laughs> I nearly spat that out everywhere. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> Guys, today we are going to talk about um, the RBA and if we think they are going to move rates earlier than previous predictions. Um, this comes off the back of Michelle Bullock's February press conference, which was a week ago now, um, a week and a bit, a week and a smidge, where I think basically like the, the key thing that jumped out to us was her comment around inflation doesn't have to drop down to that sort of 2.5% um, range for the RBA to start lowering rates. What which, was the comments as? Do we have the comment? Uh... You've put me on the spot there because I don't have a word for word. But Good one, Michael. <laughs> I always stuff it God up. damn you. Oh, you caught me out. But no, so basically, gist of it, rates can fall before inflation lowers to 2.5%. Um, and this is kind of the first indication that she's given that rates are going to move a little earlier than we previously thought. I think it was sort of second half of the year. Um, you know, industry experts have been saying, yep, they're probably going to come down. But it could happen sooner than that now. So what I want to talk about today and, and pick your brains on, guys, is what will that rate cut mean for the market? I want to look at, you know, historical data when rates have come down in the past, um, things that we've seen happen, um, and then kind of, you know, work through and unpack a, a real scenario um, or an example scenario, sorry, of, you know, how that will impact the borrowing capacity of someone looking to get into the market. So that is what we're digging into today. Um, Chris, let's start because you're our data data guy, Love numbers man. Love yes, you do. Um, so let's start with, yeah, sort of setting up the context with some, some data of what a rate cut might mean for the market based on, you know, what we've seen in the past. So just, just to go back to Michael's point for the, for the sake of the viewers, I'll pull yeah. up what she said exactly, which was... Oh, thank you. And this was a couple of days ago where... Um, she said that it's not essential that inflation slows to 2.5% before the RBA, RBA moves to lower the cash rate. Uh, so do we have to absolutely be in the inflation band before we start thinking about monetary policy is restrictive? Uh, and then she said, which it is. So it's not necessarily saying that it needs to get down to that 2%, but it needs to be around this inflation band before they start looking at rates. That to me suggests that there could be other pieces of data in the economy that they're looking at um, that they think may affect rates uh, coming down sooner than they think. So it's not just the inflation. So I think we've got inflation under control. Um, I think we know that, you know, it's at 4.1%, I believe at the moment, um, coming down. We know that it's going to be coming down. And I think they all know that it's coming down in 2024 and into 2025. But I think there's other pieces of data that's going to affect the decision making about whether rates come down and how fast they, they come down, such as probably a very key one is unemployment data, which is currently at 4% unemployment rate. And we've seen a pretty bad jobs number come out last month. We've got the next one coming out very soon. And it'll be interesting to see what those job no, job numbers look like. I think that's going to be the second prong um, to dictate when interest rates start to drop. Um, and, and I think it could be as soon as May when the first rate cuts start happening. And I, and I think as well, the prediction part, you know, there's so many different predictions. And in fairness to Governor Bullock, she's not coming out saying rates are going to drop 
four times this year or they're going to stay stagnant for the next three years like they have in the past. And even other central banks around the, the globe are, are doing that. She's coming out saying, we are going to assess the data as it comes to light and as new data comes to light and make our decision making off the back of new data coming to light, which to me is the most logical way to do it because it's without foreshadowing six months ahead because I think we live in an economy today where things change so rapidly. Um, so she's not making those decisions just off you know one inflation data. I think unemployment is a big factor that they're probably as bad as it sounds, they're going to want to see that rise before they start cutting rates because cutting rates means that there's weakness in the economy and that there's weakness in the markets. So although it's a good thing for existing mortgage holders and whatnot, it's perceived to be a bad thing in the economy. Uh, the economy is weakening, so therefore they need to cut rates to stimulate the economy. Mm. Adds off to Michelle Bullock as well because she's had a, a cracking start in her role. She's been very well balanced. And I, I love that, you know, now we've, the, we've got our new eight um, meetings a year instead of once every month. Yep. And they've got the press conference afterwards. And you see all the financial commentators digging into every word that she's saying. But she's been so balanced in everything that she says. But everyone's trying to find that little piece like you found there, this little paragraph, which actually suggests that the next rate movement could be one that is down and it could be sooner than, than anticipated. So, uh, you know, um, a lot of pundits are out in finance are saying that, you know, end of the year, September, but people like yourself, I'm guessing, Chris, starting to say that the first rate cut could happen in May. Um, are, you, are you like bullish on that based on that one paragraph or is it still like... I, I just think it could potentially come sooner yeah. rather than later because of the comments and the rhetoric, but I also think that we need to continue to see data. That yeah. may figure, let's pencil that in, right? It's definitely not a certainty by any means. Um, and we all know, I think we all agree on this part about making predictions yeah. and that we shouldn't be making yeah. predictions and, and going too far ahead and actually relying on those predictions because, again, no one knows. I love how, like you said, she's been very clear. Like, she's not saying yes or no or when. She's saying this is what needs to happen for this. This is what needs to happen for that. Unlike, you know, her counterparts in the USA yes. who are like pretty much saying, oh, yeah, we need three rate cuts. Like, it's going to happen this year. But she's also managing the expectations. Yeah, she's 100%. saying that it doesn't necessarily have to come all the way down to that, in that band range for rates to start dropping if other things in the economy start to falter right. such as unemployment um, like if, if unemployment hits four and a half to five percent we're going to start seeing rate cuts so what you're saying i guess is if things keep moving the way they are there will be a rate cut yes and it may be sooner rather than later so sentiment may be beginning to shift so everyone's been battening down the hatches trying to save as much as they can spending way too much on groceries because a bag of chips costs ten dollars it's ridiculous but everything could be <laughs> about to change I, am I right in saying that? Well, not on the grocery prices. I don't, I don't think they're going to come back down. <laughs> and I think on the cost of living, uh, that's it's a new benchmark now, unfortunately. Mm. But is the sentiment changing? So, uh, d like, you know, we've seen a quiet property market as the interest rates have been rising or a quietening down of that market. Are people going to be ready to buy again if, if rates drop? It's interesting you, you mentioned quietening down. I mean, quietening down in what respect in terms of prices? Because prices are back to Quiet, post-COVID highs. Quieting mm. down instead. Well, no, the prices are back, but there doesn't seem to be as much activity as there was, say, t two years ago. So the activity may not be there. And we we see in our in our work that there are a lot of people probably sitting on the sidelines waiting for a better interest rate environment or something like that before they do make their next purchase or, or their first purchase. Yep. Look, I definitely see that. I think we're seeing an increase in activity. We're definitely seeing an increase in listings. We've seen some of the numbers from some of the major platforms out there about the listings and we're, we're seeing that in our business as well in yep. terms of new projects looking to onboard. Um, and I think that's interesting to see that projects are now starting to come to light and get out of the ground or there's at least thought about how do we get these projects out of the ground let's bring them to market which is great on the supplier priest that we probably talked forever on in 2023 um, so it's really good to see that part um, but again I, I think employment is the biggest factor and a another big factor is if overseas banks central banks start to drop their rates we will naturally have to follow and that's we, we've always had to follow the other central banks particularly the US we, we will have to follow what happens overseas purely because of the Australian dollar I've been thinking about, you know, the next rate movement being a drop. And then I think about the banks, Jace, and you might have some previous experience on this, 
But um, we all know when the rates rise, the banks will like lift their rate the next, the following morning. It's, you get a you get an email from your bank saying, "Hey, mm. we've risen our rate, your rates mm. risen by the way, just just quietly." <laughs> but when they go down, will do you think the banks will actually pass on a, a rate movement in a downwards direction? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Because normally when the rates go up, from what we're seeing, they're passing on the rate increase in about two weeks. So it's, so it's effective in two weeks' time, but they also only increase your repayment um, after 30 days. So there's regulations around that they have to write to you uh, in the mail to let you know your repayments are changing. So yes, the rate would increase in two weeks, but the actual repayment doesn't change straight away. Yeah, so I reckon they would have to apply the rate cut in the same time frame. Yeah. Otherwise, they're going to face a lot of PR backlash. Yeah. Uh, you, you've already got like politicians talking about this now, anticipating a potential rate cut, already putting the banks on notice to make sure, hey, you pass on the rate cut as soon as possible. Yeah, so I do think that they will have um, that pressure, but that's where it's different with some major banks have a lot of pressure on PR. But some, some, some of the non-major banks make may have a different story because if a non-major bank doesn't pass on the rate cut immediately, there's not as much news about it. But if Westpac, CBA, NAB or ANZ take a long time to pass the rate cut, you're going to see it in the Sydney Morning Herald mm. yeah. straight away. Yeah, so I, th I think I think they're going to be sensible about it. Which makes sense given the difference in market share. Yeah, that's of right. Of the overall mortgage market. Right? Yeah, it's, like, it's, it's the consequence of publicity and the reputation. If everybody knows about you, they're all talking about you, easy target. So you kind of want to make sure that you, you don't do anything that's 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 going to piss off the public. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, you're, you're so... You're podcast. Yeah. <laughs> I took Jason's pause from last week. <laughs> um, wait, so Chris, circling, circling back, because at the start, you know, we were talking about like... Rate, rates have come down in the past um, and when we were chatting about this the other day, we spoke briefly about, you know, the GFC, COVID. Um, do, do, you have, do you have some juicy numbers and, and data got, and I'm stuff for some numbers here and about uh, what, what rate cuts have meant in the past and like what we've seen play out in the market? I, I think the important factor to note since particularly the, the 80s, so the start of the 80s, mm. um, where interest rates were, where they got to at the end of the 90s and so on and so forth to today. Um, interest rates, whilst they're a big factor for housing prices, they are not the determining factor on how house prices have grown. Yeah. The research suggests that from the 1980s, house prices have doubled every eight to 10 years. So yeah. 80, 1980 to 1990, all the way up to now, it's doubled every eight to 10 years. So there's a cyclical, uh, and, and that's when interest rates have been at from 17% all the way down to, what, what was it, 10 points, 10 basis points? In yeah, COVID. correct. Because at 2%. Correct. Yeah. And everything in between from GFC mm -hmm. falling after the GFC and, and whatnot. So yeah. it's... You know, we've gone from high interest rates down to low interest rates. So we've yeah. had, you know, from the highs of the 17 odd percents down to 5% in the mid 90s and slightly back up. And really from 1995 all the way out to 2010 or 2009, the GFC times, mm -hmm. rates were hovering between that 5 to 7.5%. I know I'm talking cash rate now. So between 5 to 7%. Mm -hmm. And but properties have still doubled every eight to 10 years, even during that time. Yeah, so no matter okay. what the rates are, prices... Correct. Have been prices moving. keep going okay. up. Prices keep going up. Yeah. Now, some other interesting points, population, we know we talked about this, uh, population's grown from the 80s from about 16 million to 26 million today. Mm -hmm. So we've added, you know, eight, nine million people to our beautiful country here. Um, but one other really interesting fact from the house pricing, so 1995, we had 320,000 um, public housing. And today, we've got 300,000 public housing across Australia. We have less public housing across Australia, um, which I know a lot of the community housing providers talk on this, but we've got less community housing or public housing than we do back in the 90s. Wow. So, I mean, that's definitely affected prices. Mm. Um, I had no idea. That's, that's very concerning <laughs> when you think about especially how much our population has grown over that time than... Um, cost of living crisis, and like there's more people than ever probably that are I th I think in need well, of that. There's about 140,000 people on the waiting list for public housing. So uh, that's a stat on the on the housing supply side. Yeah, okay. and I think the government is looking at that part. So in terms of affecting house prices, mm. this definitely affects prices that we're not building social and affordable housing as much as we should be. Yeah, right. 
Uh, but the, there's one chart that since the 80s that has overwhelmingly followed house prices, um, and this is money supply in Australia. So the printing of money. Uh, since the 80s, we've, I think, almost 10 times the amount of money that's in the economy. So printing of money, creation of new money that goes into the economy, um, which pushes up not just house prices, but all asset prices. Um, and that's probably a global phenomenon that's happened as well. But particularly in Australia, we're talking about the Australian market. Mm. Um, that's the one key chart that I've found that since the 80s, we had money supply like this. And then from the, from the 80s on, it skyrocketed in terms of money printing. And that's ironically or coincidentally, however you want to put it, that's the same time that property prices started to really go bananas. Mm. It makes sense, right? Because we've, we say this all the time, you give someone more money, they usually spend it. That's our, that's our natural psyche. Mm. So if there's more money in the market, people are going to spend that money. People are going to start outbidding each other Correct. at auctions and prices will naturally go up. And, and so I guess a rate cut may not have the same effect as like a mass printing of new money, but it will mean that there's more money in the market. Because if we're talking about, so we're talking about this rate cut being anywhere between May to September, I think there is potential for a rate cut in that period. Agreed. Right? Yep. Now there's a few things that are going to happen in that period as well. So another example is um, the tax cuts as well in Australia are coming in. Those band three cuts are coming in, in at obviously mid year. So that means people are going to have a bit of extra money in their pocket from the tax cuts. Anyone looking to get a loan or having a loan will have a bit of extra money in their pocket with rate cuts there's more money in the market. So does that mean that we could see a little bit of a boom or maybe a mini boom happening at the back end of the year based on what we're, what we're going to see? Can, can someone give me like the 30 second like explainer of these tax cuts and like, do they impact me? Am I paying less tax? What, what are these tax cuts? Tell me about them. Somebody, one of you. Look, so the, <laughs> you can, you, look, I'd recommend that anyone listening Googles it because there's been a lot of press about it recently, but basically anyone everyone will be getting a little bit of a tax cut okay. no, no matter what you're earning right as long as you're working in australia you'll mm. be getting a tax cut but it could be like to the tune of like 50 bucks a week or something like that okay. so i haven't done the numbers on whether you're earning 80 grand 120 grand yep. 150 grand 200 grand but let's just say the average australian could be seeing you know an extra 50 dollars a week so in their every pay packet. taxpayer in australia will pay less tax exactly yeah, that's slightly right. less yeah, tax that's exactly right. slightly less. okay but that yeah. 50 dollars cool. a week could mean more in terms of your mortgage serviceability right James? yeah look definitely there's going to be an increase in borrowing capacity yeah. but is it is it going to be so significant that it's it's going to increase by 100,000 probably not yeah okay yeah, but it if you are on the borderline at the moment right now of your borrowing capacity and let's say you want to hit a certain budget, mm. it is worth having a chat to your mortgage broker around, hey, what would it mean to my borrowing capacity if we're calculating you know, the amount of net pay I receive using the next financial year's mm. tax rate? Because they've, they've made a change to the stage three tax cut is that originally I, I think it was people on the high income bracket of 200 grand was getting a lot more. A lot more, yeah. So now they've changed the to spread it out so that everyone gets a fair share. So, so, so it's not that if you earn less, you get less of a tax cut because you, you probably need more of a tax cut. They were saying back then you. the original stage three was anyone from 40 to 200 was going to be in like a 30% yeah. tax bracket across the board, yeah. which would have meant like signif a significant difference. So That's someone, right. That's someone right. earning 200 grand a year yeah. would have got like 12 grand. Something like cut, that. Whereas yeah. now it's closer to like four. And correct, a half, correct. Maybe. I think it's just averaging yeah. it out yeah. a lot better. And I think it's, yeah, it's it's really necessary. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. so that, that can certainly make a small difference. Mm -hmm. right? And and that could be a 20, 30 grand difference in the budget for your next purchase. Yeah. Uh, so it's worth having that discussion. Now, the impact for everyone is different. It depends on what your levels of income is at, how much the tax cut is going to affect you. But have that discussion have that scenario because it can be calculated. But I think in terms of, I mean, if everyone gets the same advantage, mm. is it really an advantage? If everyone gets a tax cut, they get increased to their borrowing capacity. Yeah, so, so that's- If a, the four of us have the same advantage, do I, do I even have an advantage? Uh, well, look, it depends because the mm. four of us are on different levels of income. The four of us have different goals on the top of properties we want to buy. The four of us are looking at different areas. So we're not all buying the same property. But if I'm looking for yeah. a particular type of property, and let's say the four of us are looking for that same property, mm. if we all go from here 
to here. Like we're all just going to pay the same amount. So I don't think we're getting much of an advantage. But that, that's assuming that, yeah, but for example, for someone, the tax cut may not make a difference in their borrowing capacity, right? Yes, it's increasing it, but it doesn't allow them to reach that budget, Okay. right? But for someone else, it does. And with more money in the system, it's pr there's probably an advantage for anyone that can sort of see it coming and is prepared to move first. So the advantage is in the, f the first mover. So anyone that like anyone that's listening to us going, okay, there's going to be a tax cut. I'm going to get a bit more of a, of a, of, um, there's a tax cut. Uh, sorry, there's a tax cut and a rate cut coming. Let me speak to my mortgage broker, work out what my capacity is so that when those things happen, maybe I can make a move. Because anyone that's making a move six to 12 months later than that could be paying 20 grand more based on that's the extra right. money in the system, that's right? right? And that's not, look, there's no, this is not financial advice, but it's just an assumption. But if you can see that coming and you can make the first move, then you have the advantage. But if you wait until the whole market's moved, then you, you don't have that advantage. You're just buying what the market's buying. Mm. I think the biggest impact for rate cuts, yes, you get extra borrowing capacity. I know, Jace, you've got some examples of how that works, uh, practically for first-time buyers. And yep. But I think the biggest factor is it's a confidence game. I always say this property is a confidence game. And when people start seeing others out there buying property and they get confidence from others mm. because there's uh, rate cuts and they're seeing that we've probably definitely peaked in the rate hike cycle and environment. So they're seeing that confidence. They're seeing everyone else going out. I think that gives people confidence to then go out and transact and look for property again. Damn, 100%. I was it's just about to game. say that. So in that case, I'll just stay quiet. You'd say it again. Maybe you'll say the it next five minutes. Stay quiet because <laughs> I'm just thinking about my next point now. <laughs> That's interesting, Jess. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> if you're liking what you're hearing so far, then make sure you check out Property Now on socials, where we share exclusive insights and behind-the-scenes looks that don't make it into the full episode. But is there? Are there? Do you have any real figures in terms of like, say, like first-home buyer scenario? looking at like that 750 to 800k sort of mark budget yeah like what's are there any real numbers from a mortgage serviceability yeah so sometimes we do do some scenario calculations um so when we were doing calculations when rates were going up we were calculating for the customers hey the rate is at this at the moment but you're not going to buy tomorrow yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so if the rate does go up by 0.25 percent this is how it affects your budget so it's good for the person to know um, so the same thing for a rate cut that we've done some calculations because of what's potentially going to happen um, is that we notice it's about a 20 grand difference. Yeah, so if it, so if you're looking at, say, average income uh, for two people, let's say 170 grand or 85 grand each, you know, looking at buying something, say, about 800,000, mm -hmm. um, the difference we looked at with the current rates versus if there was a 0.25% reduction in rates is that every 0.25% reduction will give you about $20,000 more borrowing capacity. Mm. Now, now, this only helps someone if, if borrowing capacity is a challenge. If right? on the, they're on the edge of that. Correct. It, it, you know, if deposit's a challenge, that the borrowing capacity increase may not necessarily help you. Yeah. Mm. Um, but if you're looking at, say, buying an $800,000 property, and this is in New South Wales, because we always find that as a sweet spot. There's no stamp duty. So you're saving 30 for something thousand buyer. for a first yeah. home buyer. Yeah. Um, you, know, you can also buy with a 5% deposit with a guarantee from the government. You know, so you could literally buy a property with only 5% deposit and borrow the rest. So you'll need to borrow about 760,000. Uh, your any, outlay is 40 grand. Any LMI? No LMI. No LMI. Yeah, no, they be, they because of the guarantee from the government. Yeah, from the government. Wow. If you qualify, um, yeah, and they've got the criteria, but you know, like a couple or a household with 200K of income or less qualifies. So if you're earning say 85 grand each, which is, you know, like a decent income, like an average income, mm -hmm. um, you could look at buying a property for eight hundred thousand with only spending forty thousand in total deposit. So you will have the capacity. You have the capacity now for seven sixty a couple. Uh, so so if we're talking about hypotheticals, yeah. you know, we did this scenario for a client, um, a, a couple on one hundred seventy k combined income. They both yeah. have hex, right? Young first home buyers. Um, at the moment, they can only borrow about seven forty k. So they need to borrow 760. But with the rate cut, they'll be able to borrow in 760. See, that's huge. That's yeah. actually huge because what, like, like we said earlier, the market has slowed down instead of activity. Yep. And we're seeing a lot less in the last 12 months. We've seen a lot less first-term buyers in the market. Mm. Something like this, this one cut, yep. in your scenario, that is literally the difference between being able to buy your first property and not. 
Yeah, so that's exactly actually right. a pretty big deal at that lower stock level. That's right, because maybe to someone it might be, oh, can't you get twenty grand from your parent? Look, not everybody's in that position, yeah. and twenty yeah. grand's a lot of money. Right? That could be, you know, yeah, yeah, the difference of buying a car and so forth. Yeah, yeah wow. so so if you can only, you know, if you are looking at a property, it is eight hundred thousand, and you're missing that twenty thousand dollar gap, then you have to go down the on the budget. Yeah. Right. So that's the difference. So twenty grand is the approximate difference. And this is on the assumption that if rate cuts happen or when rate cuts happen this year, that's right. That property prices stay the same. Mm. Exactly. Mm. Which makes that first mover advantage so important. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, because that, that makes it difficult to get the approval side of things, and then trying to time it, which is a, the most difficult thing, mm. trying to time it. Yeah. And they say don't try and time it. It's being being in the market is the key. Yeah, that's right. So I always think that. Even if you can only borrow seven hundred and forty thousand at the moment, and it's not going to allow you to hit your eight hundred thousand budget or your target goal, you still should get pre-approved because then you have everything in order. You might find that property is only seven eighty or seven seventy, so you're ready to buy. So when that the rate cut happens, that can be updated on your pre-approval during, settle- during the settlement period. Yeah, right. Or, or for example, you still haven't found something. Right, your your pre approval can be adjusted and updated, and you'll be in a slightly better position. Correct, well. correct. So, so it's ongoing, right? And plus, you have that dialogue and conversation with your mortgage broker that's constantly happening. So you can find out, hey, I've just heard about a rate cut. How does that impact my situation? I actually like that. It's not about just go out there and buy whatever you find straight away. I know you've been looking for two years. Just go buy something straight away. It's more about getting ready, getting the advice. Yeah, get prepared. That's right. Get prepared. That's, I mean, that's right. actually a good message to get out there. Yeah, because mm. getting prepared is not like you do it once and then you have to do it again. Once you get prepared, you already started that conversation. You got that relationship with your mortgage broker. That's the hard And part. if your mortgage broker is a good mortgage broker, they should be on the lookout to know, hey, the rate just dropped. Right? This is what it means for you because I know buying capacity is really important to your situation. Mm. Uh, now, if they don't do that, that's okay too, right? You can always reach out to your mortgage broker or your lender and say, hey, I know the rates just dropped. Because whenever the RBA is going to increase or drop rates, you'll get 70,000 emails and messages about a rate card or rate increase. So so you're not going to miss out on that info. So speak to your mortgage broker. What does that mean for me? Can you do a, another calculation? Mm. You know, but you'll be a lot clearer with what you need and what what's your financial position as opposed to just assuming things, right? So, so that's on the client side, Jace. Do you have any thoughts about where the market might head on, you know, if, there's any, if there is an interest rate cut in the next few months, what do you think that means for, for the market generally? For the yeah, look, market? I think there's, to your point, about the confidence. Yeah, because, and to what Michael's saying, that there are people sitting on the sidelines. So I think the biggest impact of a rate cut, um, of a tax cut, is that actual um, sentiment that it changes. It's not the material change that is going to allow someone to borrow extra 20 grand because not everybody is in that situation where they're needing that 20 grand difference in the borrowing capacity, mm. right? But they're going to feel more confident. Oh, the the interest rate's on a downward trend yeah, that's as opposed to it's on an upward trend mm. because at the time when it was going up, it didn't mean some people couldn't buy anymore just because one interest rate increase. But it, it, it was the outlook. Oh, if I buy now, I don't know where the rates are going to end up at. It's the they what could if, be at 9%. What if they go another 2%? Yeah, yeah so, so I don't want to take that risk. I'll just sit tight, continue to rent or live at home and see how things turn out. But the same thing with the rate cut. Oh, great. This is a good time to buy because rates are on the downward trend. Yeah. Right? They're going down now. So my repayments are going to reduce. So if I can handle it now, I'll definitely be able to handle it in the next six months, four months, whatever. And I don't think it's going to go crazy. Everyone, not everyone's going to just go, oh, great, one rate cut, let's go. And like, let's take this market to the moon. But it's probably like a good, it's more of a sigh of relief in general for anyone that is saving up, you know, because they're going to have a bit of extra cash in their pocket so they can save a little bit faster, a little bit harder over the next six to 12 months. Anyone that's like keeping up with the rates, all of a sudden it's like, okay, we're going to take a little, a little drop. So I just see it as a massive sigh of relief. Um, I'm of the belief that the last rate rise was probably one too many for us, um, but it's certainly doing the trick. And and I th- yeah, I just personally, and I think in general, massive sigh of relief. It's coming. Yeah, we've seen the top. You know, we're, the rate cuts are coming. Uh, sorry, the tax cuts are coming, so I can afford that ten dollar bag of chips at Coles now. No <laughs> worries. But it's 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 just giving a bit of confidence mm. back, which is yeah. Right. And I think just to add. I think more conversations will get started. Yeah. And that's the difference, mm. right? So, for example, it could be, hey, 
there's been a rate cut. Do you think we should go talk about our borrowing capacity with our mortgage broker? Right, like the possibility because of this happening, people will be thinking about having a conversation. And prior to that, it could be, oh, this is all too difficult. Let's not bother. I'm sure we can't afford anything. So you don't have that conversation. So I'm, I'm always of the belief is that the more people have a conversation with a mortgage broker to understand their position, you're going to have more people in the market that's going to buy. And they're ready to go. Correct, yeah. correct. Because those conversations always open up surprises. Oh, I didn't realize that we could afford a property at this price. Or you get some education from the mortgage broker, for example, to say that, hey, maybe you should adjust your expectations because you're buying your first property. It's not the property you're going to live in for the next 20 years. Instead of you know being um, uh, dis- uh, discouraged in terms of buying a $1 million property because you can't get that budget, why don't you look at an 800K property? And then in five, seven years' time, you're likely going to need to upgrade. So you could turn that into an investment property. So stepping you could sell that and moving. So those things really open up possibilities, I think, for for customers or for people looking to buy property. And if you're not having those conversations, mm. that's not happening. Hey, Zaz, yeah. Yeah. you as a like potential first-home buyer, mm-hmm. so you've been listening to us talk about rate rises for the last episodes <laughs> and supply <laughs> issues and yeah. migration and its effect. Now, all of a sudden, a little bit of positivity there from Jace. Mm. How does it make you, the first home buyer, feel? Yeah, I mean, I think like the big thing that I, I get from talking to Jace and, and listening to these conversations is that like it, it's never too early. Um, I know never too early to start that conversation. Like it's yeah. never a bad idea to yeah. speak to a mortgage broker and get uh, educated on your situation and what options are available to you. Um because I've, I've wanted to buy property for years, but I think, yeah, the last couple of years, seeing how prices, house prices have gone up so much, I've been getting priced out of the areas that I traditionally wanted to buy in. Um, and seeing interest rates go up, obviously, that sort of led me to, you know, buy into that oh, this just isn't a great time for me to get into the market right now because yeah. I'm at the top of my capacity yeah. and it's only going to get harder and I'm not going to be able to to manage and keep up. Um, so I think knowing that, you know, things are changing. Jace, you were saying, you know, that confidence is, is going to increase and um, I think, yeah, the point that I would that has really resonated with me and the point that I would get across to anyone else in my situation that is kind of sitting on the sidelines waiting for rates to come down before they seriously think about what their move is going to be. Don't wait for that. Have the conversation now um, and and be prepared. Get your pre-approval and get ready so that when we do start to see rates come down, you, you're good to go and you know what you want from the market. Like I I've been flipping and flopping and like, oh, am I, is it going to be my first home or is it actually better to, to get that first investment property, you yeah. know, in an area that it might even not even be in New South Wales, um, but just to get like a run on the board, um, really. Yeah. So, yeah, no, to, long story short, feel good. Oh, yeah, it's good advice. <laughs> so, change of search results from Vaucluse, no more Vaucluse. Yeah, no that's out. Results. No more Coogee. Mm, no, nah, that, that ain't my area. No offence. <laughs> in a West gal sorry not sorry sorry not sorry <laughs> look yeah. I, I think the, the interest rates is one component of it and I think we're I'm going to put the whole money printing um, story aside because I think that's a huge impact but let's park that whole discussion I think interest rates coming down it will have an effect on property is it going to go crazy like we all think I think probably not because I think they might also wait to see a movement in unemployment and, you know, if we go from 4% unemployment, which it currently is, which the current unemployment rate is, and we go to 4.5, that's another roughly 130 to 140,000 Australians out of full-time work, which is a huge number. And that's probably some of the people that are potentially buying property. Mm. Uh, you know, it's interesting because if people, average age of first-time buyers are 36, uh, so you're not buying property at 36. So that also takes out, you know, from 36 to 65-year-old, that's the bracket of people working. Um, if redundancies and unemployment happens within those brackets, that's also the people that are buying property. So mm. interest rates falling does signal a weaker economy or weakening economy that they're trying to stimulate. So it may not be as um, stimulative to property as we think. I think the biggest factor is the money printing side of things. Uh, but unemployment and inflation, which is under control in my view, it's, it's getting to that point of being under control. Mm-hmm. We'll start to see interest rates come down, um, but the unemployment story is now the next one to focus on. I think that's the biggest risk to property is, um, you know, mass unemployment. 
That's a huge yeah, risk. Yeah, right. Okay, because people won't be able to service able to... alone. Or... Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good point because when mm. rates were going up, the reason that they didn't see as many mortgage arrears or they anticipated, oh, people are not going to be able to afford their properties, they're going to be selling their properties, there's going to be heaps on the market, is because that people could maintain and handle and were more resilient than expected on, main, on, on meeting their obligations on yeah. the repayments. Right? Look, one but, of the big things during the rising interest rates yeah. was, and it's quite rare with such aggressive um, interest rate rises, was if you did get into trouble at any particular point in time, the mortgage, the invisible mortgage cliff, you could have just sold the property. And, you know, if you didn't buy in the last couple of years at peaks, you, you were relatively okay. Mm. Um, you could sell that property and you wouldn't be losing too much, if anything at all. You'd still be making a gain if you've held it for quite a long period of time, if, if you couldn't manage those payments. So there's always that exit plan. Whereas if there's mass unemployment, that exit plan of, I can just sell the property again, I don't believe that will be there if there's mass unemployment. Because the next person that is potentially going to buy that property is potentially unemployed. So that creates a bit of a dampener on property. Right. So unemployment historically has had the biggest impact on property, aside from the money printing side of things mm. from the 1980s. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> mm. That's become our new thing. Be our, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. For, for Interesting. context, go watch the last episode <laughs> <laughs> to see Jason's amazing. Word That's of the interesting day. Point. It was at least a 16 second pause last week. It felt yeah. like it at the time. Anyway. What do you reckon, Jace? Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know what was going on up there. Uh, <laughs> just play that music. You got like a monkey you in your head just like else. clapping <laughs> <laughs> symbols. Yeah. Um, all right, guys. Well, as always, super, super insightful. Um, if we had like one little bit of, you know, advice for someone sitting on the sidelines, been wanting to get into property for ages, but maybe been putting it off, is there one piece of advice we would leave for the Zazas of the world? Get your shit in order. Like, get your now's shit the time in order. to get prepared and maybe maybe the time is coming. So get ready. There yeah, is hope. To, to go on that, if the time is coming, I think there's never been a better time to look at your long-term plan mm -hmm. and figure out how property buying, which may be in your realm now yeah. uh, with falling rates over the next few months, uh, look at your long-term plan and see how that can fit in. Love yeah, it. totally agree. Use this urgency and what's going to happen as your call to action. Start that conversation with the mortgage broker. Don't delay. Mm. You can, it's so easy to do that. Have a chat. Speak to Jason he and his team. <laughs> <laughs> Little plug. But, you know, and just something on that, like I was super intimidated to speak to a mortgage broker. And like for full context, the only mortgage broker I've spoken to is Jason and his team. Um, I was super intimidated because I was like, I don't know enough about this. I don't have enough money. I don't even know what I want from property. I had so many unknowns and I was like really freaked out and put it off for a very long time. It's the voice. I was thought you were going to say, yeah, intimidated by the sexy voice. <laughs> Yeah, what that, do you want? That too. Okay, tell me, <laughs> your, you want tell me your income. How much money you got in your bank? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, <laughs> okay, stop, stop. But no, I was genuinely. I was really intimidated because I thought I had to come in with all yeah. the info, all yeah. the answers. I thought I had to know my shit, and really, you don't. Um, and maybe that is obvious to people, but for whatever reason, it wasn't obvious to me. So I've, don't yeah, be intimidated. You're not alone. I've heard. I've got friends who yeah. said the same thing, and I'm like, oh, just like. Just go and have the conversation. Yeah. You don't need to have they a manila scary. folder. They need to help you and give you the options, yeah. right? That's what yeah. you're there for. Yeah, 100%. And I think there's also you know, some sort of feeling that if I go and speak to this person, I, I feel like if I, if they can't do anything for me, I'm not ready. I've wasted their time. Mm. Like there's that because you're not paying for it, right? Yeah. Yeah, so so there's that guilt because you want to reciprocate. You know, you've, 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 you've sat down with someone for 30 minutes, 45 minutes, and there's nothing there. And also, there. are you locked in? Yeah, correct. Are you locked correct. into that broker? Yeah, not at or all. Or can you go, mm. you not know what all. I mean? Yeah, so people, yeah. people might feel like. Yeah, every good broker is more than happy to have a conversation. There's so many customers we nurture. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so it's, it's not about. Well, I'm we, one of them, right? Correct, I that we speak anything. to you and then bang, <laughs> you're getting a pre-approval. No, you speak to us. So you understand where you are and then we can let you know what you've got to focus on. Mm. Yeah. And I always talk about you know, the deposit and the buying capacity. Then at least you're very clear. You know what, I've got great buying capacity. I just got to focus on deposits. So let me think about solutions, mm. whether I'm borrowing some money from family, I'm saving more. Yep. What do I do to increase my deposit? So you're going to be much clearer on your goal yeah. as opposed to thinking, oh, maybe this is where I am. Maybe I can't do this. Right? You get a lot more clarity. And it's just a conversation. And I think most brokers will be more than happy to have that conversation That's because good. you know they've added value to you. Mm. And then very likely once you're ready, you would go back to the same person. 
Yeah, true. Moral Look, of the story, market is moving. You should be too. Get your shit in order. You should be moving. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> Market's moving. You should move. Yeah. All if right, you guys. want. If you want. Nah, do <laughs> no, it. No, no, not if you want. <laughs> let's be more. Let's be more. Let me end on a powerful note, goddammit. <laughs> no when inac- no when inaction. would now be a good time? It costs you nothing to have a conversation. <laughs> right? Yeah. Let's, yeah, yeah. No more inaction. Speak to Jason, he. LinkedIn, yeah. TikTok, <laughs> check him out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Mr. Kalita. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <Mr>. Interesting. <laughs> 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 The Property Now podcast offers opinions on Australian property news for informational and entertainment purposes only, and they are general in nature. It does not take into account your objectives, financial situation, or needs. It does not constitute professional advice. Always seek expert guidance before making any property-related decisions.